The second windfall, and please take this the right way, but the year that surveillance capitalism was invented was the same year as the great tragedy that we refer to as 9-11. Now, literally, the day before 9-11, new, a new raft of privacy legislation was being discussed in Congress. And what the FTC was saying, even this is now 2001, the FTC was saying, folks, self-regulation is not working online. There's every evidence that it's not working. There were already cookies and things that were called web bugs that were doing the tracking, you know, that has evolved into the super sophisticated stuff we see now. So it was already going in this surveillance -y direction. Before I introduce our, our moderator and guest, uh, let me share with you just a very quick story on the complexity of tonight's issue um, and the expertise of our guest. Over the past month, the Ford Hall Forum has, been, has had a spirited debate about the candidates who have been nominated for our First Amendment Award, which is probably going to return uh, in the spring. I'm not going to give away who it was, but um, in advocating for the candidate that I nominated, um, a well-known co-founder of a highly used social media platform, uh, I used terms like democratiza democratization of free speech, which I think Shoshana will have um, some thoughts on. Uh, while that debate ended in a somewhat dissatisfaction for me, uh, again, I'm not going to give away who the recipient will be, many on the advisory council had shared real and valid concerns about the downsides of social media technology and the ongoing and rapid erosion of privacy. So we had a very spirited debate about it. In the recent book review, the New York Times wrote, whatever gauzy sentiments the new kinds of capitalists espouse or even believe, about building community and democratizing knowledge, it gets subordinated by the brute demands of economic survival. Hence the relentless accumulation of additional data resources, data sources, and ardent lobbying against government regulation. With that, let me introduce our moderator. Uh, Christopher Lydon is best known as the, ho uh, is, is, is known as the host of Open Source, a discussion on arts, idea, and politics on the internet and on public radio. What you may not know, and I don't think I knew, is that uh, Chris is credited with co-hosting the first podcast, which is exploding. The podcast universe is exploding. Uh, in 2003 at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. With that, Chris, welcome to the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. I've been hearing about and sometimes going to the Ford Hall Forum since I was in knee pants, and it's wonderful to be a part of it. Uh, tonight, especially with uh, Shoshana Zuboff. She is the writer, and this is the book, to be quite direct about it, that we've been waiting for, to approximate a big picture story of our human slash American condition in 2019. Uh, and I really mean it. We've been, I've been waiting for this book. Our situation is many layers of it anyway, is related and it's connected quite specifically. But things like at our laptops, uh, our fingertips are in touch with more information, more power, more voice, more range, a more nearly global audience than our parents would have believed. At the same time, so many of us feel isolated, at least walled off, disengaged somehow, alienated, dispensable, somehow stripped of agency and politics as we were not the day I got out of college. We are a keystroke away from the treasures of global culture and our public conversation is a vulgar embarrassment, to put it mildly. We have an activist dream of a toolkit for social connection. At the same time, we seem to have thrown in the towel about the most obnoxious divisions in this nation born in slavery and still living with blatant tears of color, class, and wealth, as if there was absolutely nothing we could possibly even think about doing about oligarchy, plutocracy, the draining enthusiasm and confidence we associate with our beloved uh, democracy. 
Mary McGrath is here, producer of almost everything I've done in the last 25 years. Believe it or not, we talk every week about how do we explain this weird head that we are in, that our country is in, that radio is in, media is in, politics is in. And I often say to Mary, it's going to be perfectly obvious in, say, 50 years. They're going to say, the digital, stupid. We totally rewired the species, the way it connects, disconnects, talks, gives back. And I still sort of believe that. But I wonder, could it be so simple? Shoshana Zuboff's answer is, is yes and no. The condition is digital, but only because the tech has been empowered and captured by a new form, a really new form of an old economic system called, believe it or not, capitalism. And it's all been wound up, as I read her, in a lazy culture of comfort and consumerism that we've been cultivating for a very long time. I read this book, and I said, by God, she's got it. And this is the plausible, complicated, but ultimately rather simple explanation that we have not been given until tonight. Shoshana. So I've had it in my mind to start tonight in, the, in a specific way, um, so which requires your participation. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to try this out and see what happens, <laughs> because this is a pretty safe space. And if, it, if what happens is what I hope will happen, I'm going to use this all over the place uh, as I start talking with audiences about this book. You know, the, bo the book was just published uh, like a week ago. So uh, I'm still figuring out the, the best way to do this. OK, so what I would like to ask you is to just take a, a little moment and uh, answer my question inside yourself. And that is, like, what's, what's the thing that brought me here tonight? You know, what's the so what for me? Or what's the issue for me? Or what's the fear for me? Or the problem? Or the anxiety? Or the curiosity? What's the thing that brought me here tonight? And if you could reduce that to one word, you know, kind of that captures it. And just shout out that word. I'd like to hear those words. I'd like to hear what they are. Fear, Fear anger. Anonymity. Anonymity. What was it? Change. Change. Corporation. Culturation. Corporation. 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 Well, yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking I might hear and, and hoping that I would hear, as opposed to, eh, I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I was bored. <laughs> so um, it's so interesting to me that so many of us are feeling these elements of dislocation, um, the fear, the anxiety, the anonymity, the manipulation, um, these large corporations that uh, are so uh, distant from us and so beyond our ability to, like, there's nobody to call. <laughs> Let's put it like that. There's nobody to call. Um, and, 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 and so this, this book, uh, you know, this is a big book. It's true. <laughs> Only... There's 700 pages in this book, but only 525 pages of text. So I feel like I need to say that up front. So it's not so intimidating. Um, but, the, but the thing is, even though it's a big book, it's a big book because there's a lot I had to put into it, a lot I had to write down. I'm not getting any younger. I don't know when I'm going to have a chance to do that again. But I felt like I'm not writing it you know, for the reviewers or the, you know, the newspapers or the universe. I'm writing it for everybody in this room. Um, I'm writing it for the doctoral student from Norway who wrote to me this morning. And she said, I want to join the indignant scholars. <laughs> because you've, you've, you've put into words what I've been feeling, what I've been trying to understand that I didn't have words for. And as difficult as it is, 
I now have hope. I now have hope because I can, I can see with words, with language now, I can see that there are you know, ways that we can move forward and we move forward together. So I, I spent seven years, more or less, in my pajamas writing this with an intensity that um, uh, was uh, beyond anything I've ever experienced. Um, and, but I did it uh, for this kind of gathering and, and for you. Uh, so part of what drove me is the sense that once I began to understand surveillance capitalism, which I am going to explain in a moment, but once I began to understand it, I realized that this is something that goes way beyond our normal conceptions of business, way beyond even our normal conceptions of, of capitalism or economics, because it's something that is reaching into our lives. It's changing our relationship to ourselves and others. It's reaching into our rights and our understanding of our rights. It's reaching into our sense of what is normal, what is OK. Um, it's reaching into the essence of our freedom. This is a very important theme for me in the book. And then look, looking at it from a political perspective, the, the way in which it's reaching into these intimate aspects of our, of our lives and our rights and our freedoms is actually shifting the, the territory of democracy, introducing fundamentally new dimensions of social inequality that haven't even been on our radar, and changing the way that we relate to the very possibility of democracy. So, in that big framework, it really becomes something that is more than a, a market form or more than a business model, even more than capitalism itself. It's something that is shaping our lives in ways that are specifically designed to be hidden from us. So let's talk a little bit about what is surveillance capitalism. And what I'm going to do is just go through a few key points, lay out some terms of reference. And then um, uh, Chris and I are going to sit down together. Chris is going to ask me some questions and go back and forth, uh, taking some, some questions from you as well. Uh, and I'm really, really interested in, in hearing your questions. Um, now, uh, Susan, could you do me a favor? Um, five minutes before I should stop speaking, could you wave at me and tell me that? Because there is a, a short passage from the book that I want to read. And that, that will take about maybe a little less than five minutes. But you know. Thank you so much, Susan. OK. So what is surveillance capitalism? So it has long been understood that capitalism evolves by taking things that live outside the marketplace and bringing them into the market so that they can be sold and bought. For example, the idea of um, nature. With industrial capitalism, nature was dragged into the marketplace and reborn as real estate, land that could be bought and sold. Historians have written about the way in which human activity itself, the kinds of things that people did in their homes, in their cottages, in their back gardens, those activities were brought into the marketplace and reborn as labor labor that could be assigned an hourly wage, bought and sold in the marketplace. In an interesting way, surveillance capitalism follows in this tradition. And I say interesting because there are other ways in which surveillance capitalism sharply diverges from um, the norms and principles of capitalism over the centuries. But in this respect, it mirrors this history in that surveillance capitalism has claimed something from outside the market and brought it into the market to sell and buy. But in this case, the territory that it has claimed is private human experience. Private human experience has been claimed for the marketplace to be sold and purchased as behavioral data. And more specifically, the way this works is that our experience is claimed unilaterally 
for the taking. Our experience is rendered as behavioral data by the takers. Those behavioral data are then combined with very sophisticated machine intelligence capabilities. The outcome of the computation and behavioral data, the outcome is what I call a prediction product. These are computational predictions of what we will do now, soon, and later. Those predictions are then sold into a new kind of marketplace. What is this marketplace trading in? It's trading in bets on our future behavior. I call it a behavioral futures marketplace. So these prediction products are like futures derivatives, but in this case, they're derivatives of our behavior. So the bottom line, friends, is that our futures are being sold and bought in a new kind of behavioral marketplace. Now, this may sound, Shoshana, what did you, what did you have for breakfast today? But we all know that surveillance capitalism, somebody said advertising, you said advertising. Surveillance capitalism got started in the world of online advertising. The structure that I have just described to you perfectly describes the world of online targeted advertising. First of all, they started out with, um, you know, let's take Google because surveillance capitalism was invented at Google in the year 2001 approximately, between 2000 and 2002. That was the period of time it was being invented. So they had uh, our searching and our browsing and all of that, and they were using most of that data to improve the search service and to invent ancillary services like translation, for example. Financial emergency hits with the dot-com bust. They still have no way to monetize this very cool search engine that they have. Now their very swanky and glamorous investors are putting pressure on them to withdraw because they still haven't found a way to make any money. Great search, not great capitalism. Under this pressure, essentially the founders declared a state of emergency. And they, they knew that they had extra behavioral data lying around. In those days they called it data exhaust or digital exhaust. Some people call it digital breadcrumbs. So you're, you're typing, you're browsing, you're searching, and there's collateral behavioral data that's being spun off by this. Back then, Google had it in servers that weren't, it wasn't well organized, it wasn't valued, it was just considered waste. Some people had been fooling around with it. They understood that some of these behavioral data really had tremendous predictive power. So in financial emergency, they declared that famous state of exception, that famous political tool, and they said, we're gonna take these data from the data logs and we're gonna use that to create predictions about future behavior. In this case, the future behavior is pretty simple. What you're going to click on, what ad you are going to click on that, to get that click-through rate. That click is a piece of behavior. So they put together their computational power with the surplus data that they had that they weren't using. Out of that came these predictions what you're gonna click on. And they said to the advertisers who used to, like they used to um, pick keywords for pages that they would show their ads. They said to the advertiser, forget about that. You are not gonna have any say now in where your ads go. We're gonna tell you where to put your ads based on our secret computation. And you, you, uh, you're gonna buy, you know, they had auctions, you're gonna you know, buy access to the pages that we tell you and you put your ad there and you're gonna see your click through skyrocket. And that's exactly what happened. But you see how those online targeted ad markets are really markets that are betting on our future behavior, our click through, right? So I'm just trying to move back a little bit from the detail because everybody says, oh, it's advertising, it's advertising. But the thing is, this whole logic, this economic logic has moved way beyond the online ta targeted advertising market. It's now spread across every economic sector. 
the insurance industry, the entertainment industry, the finance industry. Right now we have the CEO, to, CEO of Ford Motor Company, and this is very interesting, of course, because Ford is the, you know, the birthplace of mass production, the place where products were essentially discovered for the modern world of consumption. Now the CEO of Ford facing slumping international sales that aren't gonna come back anytime soon. He's saying, gee, we want those uh, profit earnings ratios that look like Google and Facebook. How come they've got all that money and we, we can't even uh, flog our cars anymore? What we're gonna do is we're gonna reconceptualize all these vehicles with the little blue ovals that say Ford. We have 100 million people in those vehicles. We're gonna get the data from those people. We're gonna get their data. And these vehicles are gonna become like little surveillance bubbles. And we're gonna put those data together with all the data we have from Ford Credit. Because he says, we know everything about you. We know what you do, where you go. We know about your house. We know about all your other expenses. We know everything about you. We know your history. We know about your marriage. We know everything about you. So we put in the streaming data from the vehicles together with all the information we have from Ford Credit. We know more about you than practically anyone. Certainly more than Tesla, forget about Tesla. We know as much about you, we're competitive with Google and Facebook. And we're going after those profit margins. So it began in 2001 with online targeted advertising. It is now everywhere becoming the dominant form of capitalism in our time. As all these folks who can't get margins in their industries are coming here to surveillance capitalism for the holy grail, margins. All right, so a couple of major category era, errors that are consistently made in this discussion. Surveillance capitalism is not technology. That is a category error. We have plenty of examples of digital technology, wonderful digital technology, used in ways that are not expressive of surveillance capitalism. In fact, in the book, I go into several examples like this, but like one of my favorites, um, a big report called The Aware Home, published at Georgia Tech in the year 2000, before the invention of surveillance capitalism. So the Georgia Tech engineers put forth their design for an aware home. It's gonna have sensors in the walls, and then you're gonna have like maybe a little wearable computer or something that you carry around, and all the data from those sensors goes into your computer. They put out the schematics. The schematics are one circle, a, a closed loop, and there are two nodes on the schematics. One is the sensors in your walls, and the other is you. There's nobody else there. And the engineers say, you know, given privacy considerations and, and all the intimacy of one's home, uh, it's very important that the data only go to the, the, the occupant and the occupant decides, what does it mean? How do I want to use it? Who, who do I want to share, share it with? All right, fast forward to our time. These two wonderful scholars at the University of, of London do this analysis. You buy one Nest thermostat. Nest owned by Google, as you know. You buy one Nest thermostat and you put that on your wall, yeah, it's gonna do a lot of cool things, many of the things that the Aware Home was gonna do. But, they, these two scholars say, with that one Nest thermostat, if you care about your privacy, you better sit down and you better get comfortable because you have to review a minimum of 1,000 contracts privacy agreements, terms of service contracts, user agreements, if you wanna figure out what is happening to your data as the movements in your home are being picked out, siphoned off to unknown third parties, maybe even the audio in your home is being picked up, siphoned off into unknown third parties. Those third parties have their own contracts that you have to read about their responsibility with your data because they're also siphoning it off to unknown third parties in an infinite regress, which is why I wore this dress today because I wanted to illustrate. See, it has a, a zipper and a zipper. So I thought it's sort of like the infinite regress of this that I wanted to talk about because there's actually no way 
truly to know what's happening. You might have heard that um, the story about the dolls that spy. Were you? Did you catch that? Uh, it's called the Kayla doll, which was um, as this started coming out, you know, it was quickly banned in Germany, where people really give a toss about privacy. But this is a doll. Um, you know, obviously sold for children. There was one version for a boy, one version for a girl, the Kayla doll. Anyway, what the researchers, researchers discovered is that the Kayla doll is, not, is recording what the child says and those, quote, dialogue chunks, because in the business of selling behavioral surplus, voice data is referred to as dialogue chunks. These dialogue chunks were being siphoned off to another company called Nuance Communications, which buys the dialogue chunks in order to analyze, um, develop uh, uh, analytic capabilities for voice recognition, and then Nuance sells these dialogue chunks onto the CIA uh, to help it with its uh, voice recognition capability software. And on and on and on it goes. So now what have I described to you? I've described to you, for, it's not just Google, folks, and it's not just Facebook, and it's not just Ford, it's not just any company. Now we have an ecosystem of behavioral surplus suppliers. The folks who are just, you know, they're in their niches, like with this doll. They're collecting data that no one else can connect. They're grabbing that experience, that private experience of the child and her doll. How much more private does that get? turning it into behavioral data and selling it. So there's suppliers. So we have suppliers, then we have the machine uh, analytics specialists. We have the market makers who create the behavioral futures markets and host them with their business customers. And these are developing in every sector and every kind of industry. So we have ecosystems and we have hubs and we have all of this activity all of it directed to others' financial gain. The people who play in these futures markets to lay bets on your behavior so that you will buy or do or say or act in a way that is most convenient for their profit margin. Now, I'm gonna go one little step further and then I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna just read you a couple paragraphs and then um, Chris and I will we'll hunker down. But here's the thing. So everything that happens, everything that's been happening with Facebook that we've all been so upset about, everything that happens every day uh, in my um, imaginary podcast in my head, which is called This Week in Surveillance Capitalism. <laughs> but er we could do that, Chris. <laughs> we could do that. Um, ben. So, Everything that happens is utterly predictable once you understand the economic logic. So what I want to say about that is like, this is not that these are evil people. I mean, okay, they're capitalists. You can't really blame capitalists for wanting to make a boatload of money if democracy isn't smart enough to, feel, to figure out how to, how to either stop them or regulate them or tether them to our interests. They're gonna keep going and they're gonna do whatever they can until we tell them, you cannot cross this line, <laughs> back off. <laughs> so, you understand the economic logic. What they are, are they are prisoners of their own economic imperatives. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about that and move on. So first of all, the whole thing is about whether my predictions are as good as they possibly could be. The best predictions obviously are equal to observations. Okay, so I just got my five minute. I'm gonna do this quickly and then I'm just gonna read you a thing. We'll be all right. Okay, so the best predictions um, equal observations. That's obvious, right? I mean, why predict if you can actually observe? They started out saying, okay, the best data for really robust predictions is that we need a lot of it. We need economies of scale. Economies here means automated. You get that, right? Because all of this, all of these imperatives are acting through the ubiquitous digital architecture in which we live. 
What is that architecture? Well, it starts with our phone, obviously, right? You know, we got our laptop and we're bra everything we're doing online, of course. And then we go out the door with our phone. And at this point, this digital architecture is everything you see with the word smart in front of it. Every product with the word smart in front of it, every service with the word personalized in front of it. Let those antennae go up because all of these things are simply supply chain interfaces for your behavioral data. So they start out saying, okay, we need scale. We need mass, we need volume, we need a lot of these data. And that's when you know, they set themselves to figure out, well, we, it's, we, it's not enough just to take it from your browsing. Like we've gotta go all over the internet. We've gotta figure out other things. You may have said you don't wanna share this. You may have said this is private, but we're just gonna like politely ignore that and take everything that we can find. And we're gonna do it in ways that are specifically designed to bypass your awareness and keep you ignorant, deeply ignorant forever. So it starts with scale and then they're competing on scale and pretty soon they realize, you know what, scale's not enough. We need different qualities of data. We need scope, we need variety. So that's really when they wanna kick you out of your house off your desktop, get you out into the world. That you remember when mobile became so important? That's because your phone is mobile now. We're with you all the time. What's that old, I'm gonna date myself, you know, that old police song? Andrew, you know the name of that old police song. What is it, like every step you take, you know? <laughs> all right, I'm dating myself. All the young people are sitting over here. Okay, don't even listen. Okay, so, um, so they're going with you out into the world. Every step you take, they're watching, they're listening, they're making sense of it, they're translating it into data. It just starts with your location and goes from there. Okay. But then even that's not enough because they want the depth. Not just everywhere you're going, but they want the depth. They want your tears. They want your bloodstream. They want the condition of your pancreas. They want your face so that it can be put through an analysis that immediately computes your emotional state. Same with your voice, your emotional state, your level of anxiety, your joy, your fear, all the things that we talked about. So they're going down. All right, competition continues. More competitors coming on stream. Finally, they realize the most competitive most predictive data comes from actually intervening in the state of play and pushing you to behave in a certain way, coaxing, nudging, tuning your behavior, hurting behavior. The more they can push you in a certain direction toward their guaranteed outcomes, the better their predictions are, always approximating observation. I write about the game Pokemon Go of course, incubated at Google. Niantic Labs, Pokemon Go, Niantic Labs began at Google, run by the guy who was the mastermind behind Google Earth uh, before it was Google Earth. Uh, it was a CIA investment, became Google Earth, then became Street View. Later, it became Pokemon Go. So Pokemon Go is a fun game, and the family can play it. But digging, 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 what you find is that all over the city, there are markets that have been created. These futures markets I'm telling you about. So there are restaurants and shops and bars and pizzerias. There are uh, places you know, where they fix your car and uh, retail outlets and so forth. These places are paying Niantic for footfall. What does that remind you of? So they're paying Niantic for footfall. That's exactly like an online advertiser, right? Paying Google for click through. All we've done is shift it to the real world with your real body and your real life in real places. Okay, so that's, that's actually how Pokemon Go makes money. 
getting paid by these business customers. So yeah, they'll have a Pokemon gym in the bar, or they'll have creatures in the back room of the restaurant. So they're getting you there, guaranteed footfall. So I came to understand Pokemon Go is kind of like a, an experimental dry run for the smart city. Uh, anybody here from Toronto? <laughs> right now uh, in, the, in the crosshairs of the smart city. You know, the smart city, Google likes to think of it as the Google city. You know, where we can shunt and herd populations uh, in the patterns that are going to be most profitable for the people who are playing in these markets. Okay, so now we're talking about real interference in our behavior, a means of behavioral modification, all of it designed, again, outside of our awareness to maintain our ignorance, thus robbing us of rights of contest, robbing us of rights of, co of combat, robbing us of the opportunity to resist because we have no idea what's going on, and therefore robbing us of our most fundamental decision rights, gently shaping our futures for us, which is the essence of our free will to be shaping those futures for ourselves. Okay, that's enough to get you started. Um, I wanna read a couple of paragraphs and then uh, Chris and I will, will continue. How many, could you please raise your hand? Um, how many people in the room are under the age of 30? Oh, yay, and you, I, I thought so. You all sat in, you all sat in one, one group together, okay. Um, I hear that the undergraduates come back, uh, is it tomorrow? So next time I, I like to come and talk to the undergraduates, Susan. Um, so um, friends sitting here, uh, this is for you. I'm reading this for you. But I'm, I'm reading it for everyone else who's over 30 and might actually be a parent. Uh, so I'm reading it for you too. This, this, I'm, I'm reading from page 521. As you know, there are only 525 pages. So this is way at the end of the book. There are only five, you heard the only. Okay, so this is way at the end of the book. And this is kind of part of, part of my summing up, you know, why we need to care about this. And I'm gonna be referring to various subjects I brought up through the book, but I think you're gonna get the point anyway. When I speak to my children or an audience of young people, I try to alert them to the historically contingent nature of the thing that has us, meaning this digital surround now hijacked by surveillance capitalism. I do this by calling attention to ordinary values and expectations before surveillance capitalism began its campaign of psychic numbing. It is not okay to have to hide in your own life. It is not normal, I tell them. It is not okay to spend your lunchtime conversations comparing software that will camouflage you and protect you from continuous unwanted invasion. Five trackers blocked, four trackers blocked, 59 trackers blocked, facial features scrambled, voice disguised. I tell them that the word search has meant a daring existential journey, not a finger tap to already existing answers, that friend is an embodied mystery that can be forged only face to face and heart to heart, and that recognition is the glimmer of homecoming we experience in our beloved's face, not facial recognition. I say that it is not okay to have our best instincts for connection, empathy, and information exploited by a draconian quid pro quo that holds these goods hostage to the pervasive strip search of our lives. It is not okay for every move, emotion, utterance, and desire to be cataloged, manipulated, and then used to surreptitiously herd us through the future tense for the sake of someone else's profit. These things are brand new, I tell them. They are unprecedented. 
you should not take them for granted because they are not okay. Have you and Edward Snowden ever been seen together in sort of, are you connected in this kind of revelation of what's actually going on and this betrayal of deep dark secrets? I've never met Ed Snowden, um, okay. if that's what you're asking. Um, so, so we've never had a conversation. Okay, I, I, uh, main question I want to ask you, everybody here likes you already, liked you before they walked in, and I bet almost everybody is carrying an iPhone, including me. We know it's exploitive. We know it's costing us immeasurable, uh, intangible qualities of our lives, our values, our culture, and yet we don't, we're not about to give them up, and our kids even less so. How can that be? And it, it, the other way to say it is, if it's so damn bad, why does everybody insist on having an iPhone in this culture? Well, as you know, Chris, <laughs> in the book, I, I, I ask the question, how do they get away with it? Which is a kind of version of what you've mm -hmm. asked me. And I answer it with 16 reasons. <laughs> so there is no simple reason. But let's talk about just a couple of them that are, are really big and, and obvious. One I've already mentioned. All of this is intentionally designed to keep us ignorant. The, the, the phrase I use for this, or the sentence I should say, is our ignorance is their bliss. Because they learned early on that as long as we have no idea what's really happening, um, we are not going to resist. Because in many ways, the things that they appear to be giving us are things that fill our needs. We're living in a time where our institutions in the real world are failing us. Politics is failing us. Politics, as usual, is failing us. So many of our economic institutions are failing us. Austerity is failing us. Neoliberalism has created you know, the 1% phenomenon, um, more draconian social and, and economic inequality than we've seen in any time in the 20th century. So in many ways, our institutions are failing us. And we went to the internet looking for help, for goodness sake. Mm. You know, if I can only spend seven minutes with my doctor when I go see her in the office because of the insurance regime in which she is now forced to operate. And by the way, she can only talk to me about one problem at a time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the insurers won't pay her for her time. If there are any doctors in the room, you'll, you'll, right, you'll corroborate what I'm saying. So we go to the internet now because at least I can take my time and try and figure out what the heck is wrong with me and what does this pill do and what does it mean and what do other people say about this, this illness and so on because I can't have these conversations in the doctor's office anymore. So we've gone to the internet to help us lead a more effective life where our institutions have failed to help us. So it's not like we're there on a lark. And, and I do dissent from one thing you said, Chris, because I don't see us as lazy and seeking convenience. I believe that that really is, is a picture that, um, that, the, that, the, uh, that the companies have painted of us, that we are so willing to sell ourselves. We, we, we get involved in this because we have to, because it's very difficult to participate socially anymore and not go through these channels that, I've, as I've just described, are also the supply chains for surveillance capitalism. Like, you want to... Let me just say, they're okay. winning an awful lot of rounds. How many times do we want to throw it away and not? How many times have I considered getting out of Facebook um, in dread of the, of the faces that'll pop up? You'll never see... You'll, she'll never see you again. You know, all, all this kind of manipulation. Uh, we are a lazy, the culture, uh, privately promoted, uh, <laughs> induces kind of laziness. I want to change this up a little bit, okay. <laughs> uh, on the, just on the title. You say over and over again in the book, surveillance is demeaning, it's, it's, it's disgusting, it's robbery, uh, and they sell it, blah, 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 blah. But you also say repeatedly, 
It's about capitalism, not the surveillance. Yes. Watch. I mean, the surveillance and our outrage in it is a kind of a, a magician's trick to, to distract us. Speak about what you say is an unprecedentedly new form of exploitive capitalism. All right. Well, I, I say that it's unprecedented because um, capitalism has always existed in some kind of reciprocity with its societies, even at its worst. For example, it needed people to work. It needed employees. So even in, in the Gilded Age, when working conditions were dire and we had very little protective legislation and collective bargaining was not yet fully protected, uh, those companies needed workers. They also needed consumers. They needed customers. And, you know, by the time we got to Henry Ford early in the 20th century and Alfred Sloan, um, this was kind of coming together in a new equilibrium. And, you know, Henry Ford was not a very nice person. And it's not that one wants to just willy nilly sing his praises, but he did get a lot of things right just by being a capitalist. And he, you know, he figured out a lot of stuff about mass production, which is, which, which, spoke to unmet needs in the population of his day and created the possibility of mass consumption and was a response to the latent needs for you know, people who wanted things to but a price that, that they could afford. So there were these organic reciprocities that even capitalist institutions had with their societies. Those are all gone now because surveillance capitalists do not need us as sources of customers. We are not their customers. We are their free raw material. Punto final. That's it. We are their free raw material. You are not the product, which I know is the cliche that we all use. You are not the product. Because somebody who's selling a product has to give a toss about the product. You are not the product. You are like the... Um, Scorched earth, you are the, you are the, uh, you know, the river that's being run dry, you are the, and you are the, the, and polluted, you are the, you are the, the piece of land that's being harvested over and over again without uh, nutrition. You are free raw material. So it doesn't need us as um, customers because it's selling these prediction products to its business customers. It actually doesn't need us as employees, not in any of the old sense. I talk about in the book the fact that Google, um, at the height of its market capitalization, employs fewer people than General Motors employed at the height of the Depression, when it had laid off most of its workforce. But are you suggesting, when you say it's new, it's wor is it worse? I mean, I think the old capitalism was bad enough. I mean, the Rockefellers uh, printed up their reputation before they went into politics, and the Fords too. But uh, they killed people. They killed Colorado miners and Detroit auto workers. This, there was a vicious regime. In, in what sense? And 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 the the evil people in the new, in the new world are talented and gifted. Some of them good, good, perfectly good family folk too, but is this something, I mean, maybe the simple question, is this, is this worse? Is this something more scary? <clears throat> As I intuit it, it is, but then I didn't know the Colorado minefields either. Yes, of course. Um, I had a, a dear, dear friend who um, was quite a bit older than I, and uh, he grew up uh, organizing uh, miners in Montana mm. uh, and later in Detroit and told me so many stories. Um, I myself uh, spent much of my childhood and uh, younger years in a, in a country where collective bargaining was not uh, safely institutionalized. So I'm, I'm very respectful of the violence and the dangers of capitalism in the 20th century. Um, but what I'm suggesting is one way that we were able to tame the excesses of that capitalism with New Deal legislation, with the legislation in the post-war era, with the institutional of collective bargaining uh, that created you know, middle class, middle class jobs and, and indeed supported the, the, the middle class in the West, that, 
that this had to do with the fact that we had these reciprocities to call upon. So that's one thing. But the second thing I think that makes this so unprecedented is it, it goes back to what I hinted at at the beginning, that here is a capitalism that is selling what? It's not selling a product in, in any material sense. It's not even selling a service. We just, we're just sort of making our way through, hopefully, uh, a waning era when financialism has largely, uh, when capitalism has largely been defined by financial speculation. So now we're shifting gears into yet another phase of capitalism that depends upon, A, the social relations of surveillance. I see you, you can't see me. But B, surveillance of what? Of the intimate experience of your life. You buy a mattress that I write about in the book and it's recording the audio signals in your bedroom. And if you don't sign the privacy policy to that mattress, a mattress has a privacy policy, a television has a privacy policy, a dishwasher has a privacy policy, and you try to buy one of these things that's not internet enabled and it costs more because they can't make the margins without the data. You see? So, so now, what is, it, what, is it, what is it surveying? What is it taking? It's taking the intimacy of our, of our life experience. And that becomes the basis for predicting our future and more and more coaxing and tuning and hurting us toward that future. So now, folks, it's not killing us. It's not murdering us. I, I want to talk about power, too, because as I argue in the book, this is not digital totalitarianism, as many have said. This is not Big Brother, and this is not the violence against the minors. But this is something that, it's like that, um, you know, what's the gas that can be in your house and you, you're, what? No, the, it's like. Yeah. Car carbon, uh, yeah, so it's like, you can't smell it, you can't see it, you wake up in the, and you don't wake up in the morning. I was about to say, you wake up in the morning and you're dead. <laughs> and you don't wake up in the morning, right? This is like that. It's like you can't smell it. You can't see it. But, you know, here it comes on slippered feet. And it's like this invisible smoke all around. And where is it going? It's going toward our freedom. I call it in the book, the, our right to the future tense. That's what it wants, because the more it can usurp our right, I'm going to stop, the more it can usurp our right to the future tense, uh, the more money it makes, and as long as we don't see it, hear it, smell it, we're, we're moving with it. I, I want to egg you on. I mean, to me, this is where it gets really, really interesting. Uh, it's not the surveillance, or beyond the surveillance, beyond the capitalism, it's the culture, what it's doing to us. You say, repeatedly in the book, the scandal is not that they're selling our behavioral data, it's that they're collecting it. How dare they? Face recognition, the 73,000 things we re way we respond to, I don't know, a, a strikeout, or a, you know, a job, or a kiss, or anything. This is, it's, it's sort of, it's beyond obscene, but I'm interested in, and you said the way it is changing the meaning of words like search or friend or friendship. They're, they're absolutely profound and maybe unremovable stains on the whole culture. Um, you mentioned Toronto. We were talking to a lady in Toronto today who is involved in sort of fighting Google for a very precious, something like our uh, waterfront zone. Google has, in effect, come in and said, um, hey, we'll do it for you. We'll, we'll just take it. And in fact, Eric Schmidt is quoted in, in Shoshana's book saying, he was so excited thinking of all the things you could do if someone would just give us a city and put us in charge. And they have said, we'll do it for you. It'll shine like crazy. It'll be modern. It'll be hip. It'll be informational, blah, 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 all the code words. 
but of course we will own it and we will know everything, every breath that is taken in that part of the world is ours. But we'll share it with you, but of course you have no idea what to do with it. They know exactly what to do with it. And the interesting thing for me, Shoshana, I asked this woman, I'm embarrassed to even contemplate, Boston has an unbelievably rich history of city politics. James Michael Curley, one of the most famous rogues that ever ran for office anywhere, four times mayor of Boston. I've lived through all of these things. If somebody said, you know, Marty Walsh is kind of boring after all, what if we just turn it over to Google? Let Google do our politics. Let them run the city. I'm afraid we'd say, hey, take it. It's yours. We, we've lost interest some time ago. This is a profound change in who the hell we think we are. Not just me, and I grew up Kevin White introduced me to my wife. So, I mean, uh, so th this is a substance of my life, but it's the lore, it's the energy, it's ethnic, it's racial, it's this, it's that, it's Brahmins, but it is our story. And that, I'm afraid we might, if New York said, if Hugo said Harlem, it's kind of a blighted spot there in the Golden Island of Manhattan, what if, we'll just call it Google Harlem and we'll take it. And they would. Would New York say, hey, well, that's one less problem to think about in the morning, or, or would they fight for it? Would we fight as, as small d Democrats for our common ownership? Well, this, it's so interesting here because what this suggests is that, you know, when, when the power is out there, you know, killing minors, as in the, the case of the, the Gilded Age industrialists and the um, early 20th century, late 19th century, um, or totalitarianism is out there ruling through terror and murder, there's no doubt where the enemy is. That's power, there's violence, and we know where we have to look to protect ourselves and what we have to fight against. In our case, all of this stuff is coming at us smiling, saying it's going to help us. We'll run your city so much better. I break this down in the book and I show that what are the social principles behind this ideology of theirs. It's post-democratic. We don't need democracy. We don't need people to vote and stuff like that because the, the, we're gonna compute all the data and it's gonna tell us the best answer. It's like the restaurant at the end of the universe. Remember that? Y'all, Do y'all know that one? Uh, you know, uh, what's the meaning of life? 42 was the answer. <laughs> uh, so, but th this is what they're arguing. This is computation now replaces politics. Populations replace societies. Um, your, your status in a social network replaces uh, the old forms of class. So now we're in a world that is literally run by technocrats owned and operated by surveillance capitalism. So this is the smart city. I warned you about that word smart that's been, been hijacked. So I've, I've really tried to, may I talk about power for a moment? Sure. Be, smart has also been. Yes, we want to get some audience questions. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. please. Audience questions, if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, so we welcome uh, all questions. Please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Why, why, why do you come? Can I ask you one uh, different question? Um, how would you describe your political imagination, your political, your politics, before, during, and after you revealed this book? I, I ask partly because Financial Times in London, arch capitalist, not wildly conservative, but a Tory financial newspaper, loves this book. The Guardian, sort of liberal, quasi-socialist, not quite Corbyn, but Labour Party, um, and intelligent. Uh, they adore this book. And I'm trying to think, nobody's gonna call you a commie or an anti-American, or but what, what would you call yourself? Well, I, I would call myself, um, above all, a humanist and a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm on the side of 
people. And I am... Sounds in, very googly, right? I, 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 I am... Don't in, be evil in, now. Come I on. am indignant. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a progressive. I'm a registered Democrat. I make, make no secret of my, my politics in that formal sense. But um, beyond that, you know, I, I believe that... Um, I believe in democracy as the best solution that millennia of human sacrifice have produced for us to be able to live together in some semblance of self-governance. Do, do you believe in search and struggle more than comfort and certainty? I believe in the dialectic of history. It's all search and struggle and conflict. Um, but, but that uh, humanity uh, somehow over the millennium, because I, I study history, and history is a dark place, <laughs> and it is full of violence and poverty and ignorance. And we've come out uh, so recently, you know, into this kind of discourse, not just for an elite, but for for all of us. And that's what I want to preserve and build on for the future. That's democracy. So. Uh, some think of me as old-fashioned because I espouse Enlightenment ideals, but I think of the Enlightenment as something that happened five minutes ago in the course of human history. And if we aren't ready to sacrifice for those ideals that took millennia to carve into the human brain and spirit, then, oh my gosh, what are we here for? What are we doing? Can I break in for one question? So one of the things that I've been thinking about is who wants our information more than companies, and that is the government. And I'm wondering if you have thought or written about how the interrelationship between these, these entities that both want to know not only about us, but what we're about to do. and, and let you go from there. Yes, brilliant question. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Obviously, I wrote a book about private surveillance because there's a lot written about, you know, our, our problems in the public sphere, and I, and I felt that um, this really needed a light uh, shown upon it. But there is a very important connection, and this goes back to the question, how did they get away with it? Um, so one of the arguments I make in the book is that there are several uh, historical windfalls, the historical conditions in which surveillance capitalism was allowed to root and to flourish. These, these guys inherited some windfalls from history. Um, one of them was that it all happened uh, under the flag of neoliberalism, a time when our societies are dominated by neoliberalism, which rejects any kind of regulation, which has stripped the power of the state and stripped the power of democracy to regulate capitalism. So that was a windfall for surveillance capitalism. But the second windfall, and please take this the right way, but the year that surveillance capitalism was invented was the same year as the great tragedy that we refer to as 9-11. Now, literally, the day before 9-11, new, a new raft of privacy legislation was being discussed in Congress. And what the FTC was saying, even this is now 2001, the FTC was saying, folks, Self-regulation is not working online. There's every evidence that it's not working. There were already cookies and things that were called web bugs that were doing the tracking you know, that has evolved into the super sophisticated stuff we see now. So it was already going in this surveillance -y direction. And the FTC knew that self-regulation wasn't working. So there's all this stuff that's being introduced in Congress and being discussed literally hours after 9-11, hours after the towers were hit. That discussion went dead. And it quickly shifted. Now, by the next day, the discussion was, we need to know everything that is going on in this country. We need to know everything that everyone is doing. Remember what they called it? total awareness, that very quickly became the new passion. Everything else took a back seat. I call this surveillance exceptionalism. Again, that concept of the state of exception. 
9-11 ushered in a state of exception and surveillance, which was plainly in violation of constitutional rights when done in the public sphere, could still be conducted in the private sphere where the Constitution does not hold in the same way. Therefore, it became a matter of intense interest to our security agencies to create a wide berth for these fledgling companies to develop their surveillance capabilities that they might be emulated by our intelligence agencies, ported over into Washington, ported over into London, ported over into, into Berlin, and so, and, and Paris, and every capital. It wasn't only America, it was all across the West, where now you have politicians saying, you know, we need to learn from these capabilities, integrate these capabilities. The NSA created this magnificent document, which was recently unclassified, that says, basically, we need to become like Google. Mm. So, you know, and that, then... That is the Snowden connection to me, and in a serious sort of way, I mean... Surveillance I, exceptionalism. Yep. Shoshana, we have another question. Yes, please. A personal story for today. Um, I'm glad that you've told me I'm not being paranoid. I wanted to be good today, so I decided I was going to go paperless on something. A statement came. It said, if you want to be paperless, just sign this here and there, and um, this will be fine. I had some extra time. I read the contract, pages and pages of what they will not be held for and what will be my responsibility. Whatever I told them, whatever I put on that paper statement was theirs and they were protected legally. So thank you for letting me know I'm not paranoid. Did you, did you sign it? Did you oh, stop no. in your tracks? Well, I will say the extra piece <laughs> is I have a family of high tech people and everyone says, oh, no, 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 come on, don't, don't worry about that. Nobody reads it. That's, I said, nobody reads it? Wow, I'm reading it, and I'm not signing. I think I'll just get another piece of paper in the mail. Thank you. There you go. Now, how about if we multiply that by a few hundred million or a billion, then we're getting somewhere. And that's where this kind of conversation can lead. I Shoshana, oh, that. sorry, we have another question. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I'm fascinated by the whole topic, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering what, it, you, what you could see in the future that could help to contain, uh, to reshape the way that our society works with, um, these seemingly uh, essential technical facilities that we all have come to expect and need in the last 20 years. Um, in Europe, they're much more attuned to their own personal safe, to their own personal data, and there are a number of suggestions as to how data should be protected. But Congress obviously has something to do with this. And I know you've mentioned already um, the uh, changes that happened with uh, the new, um, with the end of the golden age and, and the uh, trust busting that, that happened that hasn't happened here in a very long time. Um, could you comment on a path into the future that would fit uh, uh, a loosening of the, con of the control of these, the, of these mega corporations? these people that have very little employees and huge amounts of money. Um, comments about uh, a future that would be our, our own, where, where our own data would be our own. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so. Thank you. Like, how do, we, how, do we get, how do we get back to that path we were on with the aware home? You know, where we're able to avail ourselves of the, 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 the richness and the gifts that we expected from digital capabilities uh, without surveillance capitalism owning and operating the whole, the whole darn thing. 
Um, obviously, uh, we have to move toward new regimes of law and regulation, and the question is how and, and what. And so how, let's just talk about how for one, one second. Um, I read in the book about a lesson I learned from Milton Friedman when I was um, not his student, but a student at the University of Chicago. As a 19-year-old, I used to go and perch in the back of his uh, doctoral seminars so I could figure out what he was telling all those guys from Chile because um, I knew it wasn't good. But what I learned from Milton Friedman, who was um, obviously close friends and competitors with, with Friedrich Hayek, and together, you know, between Europe and the US, they were the architects of what we think of as neoliberalism today. So um, Milton Friedman used to say that public opinion today equals law in 20 years. Both he and Hayek played a long game. So we're, this is like back in the late 60s. You know, neoliberalism, neoliberalism really didn't get institutionalized in the US and UK governments until the 1980s. There's a long game. So he would uh, be out, Friedman, be out in Chicago talking to groups of high school students and working on textbooks and children's books. I don't know if anybody here remembers, but you know, he did like a PBS show where Uncle Milty would be there telling people about the history of economics and the, in the world and so forth. Anyway, a long game. So maybe we don't have as long because we live in internet time and all of that and things are happening faster. But still, we're talking about a process that I still believe begins with public opinion in the sense that we need to understand what is going on. We need to pull back the veil of ignorance that capital has built to keep us quiet, to make, uh, to, to lower the probability of any friction that gets in the way of their plans. So the first thing is understanding what's going on and talking about it just the way we're doing here tonight and the way people are doing more and more around the world, particularly since Chris Wiley blew the whistle on, on Cambridge Analytica. These conversations are going on more and more and I certainly hope that my book will contribute to that um, because that is what I wrote it to do, to contribute to that effort. So naming and, and talking and getting mad, you know, I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore. I mean, literally feeling our righteous indignation because we should feel indignant. As Hannah Arendt said, when a, a scholar criticized her for not being, uh, you know, a distant, indifferent um, intellectual, and she said, you, I do feel indignant because to rob this subject of its indignity takes it out of its human context. And, and as a scholar, I'm not willing to do that. Well, that's where we are, righteous indignation, not paranoia. <clears throat> so that's one thing. Now, the second thing is law, because um, we need laws that are going to be geared to this new phenomenon. Remember, this carbon monoxide. You can't see it, you can't smell it. They say nice things, they appear to be one of us, and so forth. Now, we have antitrust laws, and they have not been uh, well applied. And those laws are very important and there are antitrust issues with the big in internet companies and those laws should be applied and that is extremely important. We have privacy laws and those laws should be applied. They are very important and we have to build on them. But my point is that those are paradigms that we've inherited from the 20th century, as, in, as important as they are, they are not gonna take us all the way to interrupting and outlawing surveillance capitalism. For example, in privacy law, we talk about data ownership. Why do we wanna own data that should not exist in the first place? The illegitimate taking of our experience for translating into data the data of the audio signals in my bedroom should not exist in the first place, thank you very much. Thank you. Once we're negotiating over ownership, 
then we are institutionalizing the legitimacy of that taking and making into data. So we have a different kind of problem with surveillance capitalism, of its very legitimacy at that very first step. The, the, the Toronto version of that was, and Justin Trudeau is in favor of the Google takeover in Toronto. The political establishment, I presume the media establishment is all in favor of it. But the line is, well, let, let's look at their plan and see if it's any good. No, no, why, what are they doing there in the first place? It should be the question. But. The, first, the, the first premise, the very first principles. Now the second thing is what is their business? Their business is predicting our behavior. That's why I call it a rogue mutation of capitalism. Is this, I mean, we've just lived through financial speculation as our capitalism and ended up with immense income and social inequality. Is this the kind of capitalism we really want for our society, for our futures? Because it's not a capitalism that makes everybody prosperous and creates all kind of opportunity and lifts all boats. This is a capitalism for the few, not the many. For the business customers, not the sources of raw material, which is us, which is, which is the population, which is the society. So do we really want a business that the premise is that we sell your behavior for other people to make bets on it? so that they can m more accurately and powerfully manipulate you at the moment that your endorphins are at their peak because you have just finished a five mile jog and with those endorphins flooding your brain, you feel so happy, you wanna buy anything. And if I send you a push on your phone, which of course you have with you in your running suit, uh, that says, hey, the sensors in your shoes are telling me that your treads have worn down past the point of effectiveness. Here's the button, press this, we will have the exact same pair of shoes at your front door tomorrow. So <clears throat> this is what we're selling. Is this the capitalism that we want? And then to have markets whose operations are inaccessible to us. At Davos the other day, Tim, Tim uh, Cook referred to them as shadowy markets, inaccessible to this, to us. In the book, I call them ominous. They're trading in behavioral futures. I did a, I did a TV show in the New York Stock Exchange the other day, last week, which was very cool. I'd never been in the New York Stock Exchange before. I, it was amazing how small it is, very 19th century. And I said to the young man interviewing me, imagine all, all of these, these desks and flashing lights and everything around here, imagining, imagine it's all behavioral futures trading. So you've got these specialists over here who specialize in tranches of individuals, and these specialists who, who, who specialize in tranches of cities and regions and countries, or specific kinds of behavior, driving behavior, health behavior, and so forth, right? Behavioral futures. Is it, so we have these new problematic economic institutions already rooted around us. How do we regulate those? Do we outlaw those? This is not a conversation we've had because they have not come under the scrutiny of democracy, not one little bit. Can I ask you, a, 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 put it a different way? <clears throat> Imagine this question. You call it <clears throat> surveillance capitalism. We call it the information economy. And walk around Boston, Cambridge, the innovation, it has created infinite value, thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, good paying jobs, as Michael Dukakis used to say, um, individual fortunes for sure, but global reach, we're important in the world today as we were not when I was in high school. Um, they, it's, an, it's an economy that serves miraculous genomic medicine with huge data, blah, 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 blah. But it's been, it's working for me, Shoshana. My house is worth vastly more than it was. Um, Harvard and MIT build it, thrive on it. We're a much smarter population, much richer population. You call it what you want, but it's, 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 it's working. I celebrate the information economy. My response to that is 
Um, it's easy to imagine the information economy without surveillance capitalism. It's impossible to imagine surveillance capitalism without the digital, uh, without information technology. And, 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 and so this is where I, I spoke earlier about a category era, error, because surveillance capitalism is not digital technology. Let us develop digital technology. Let it be under the auspices of democracy. Let it serve the people the way the aware home serves the occupants of that house. Why has not the president of MIT said that? And the president before him, the president before her, the president going way back. We can do this. We do it with our wits. We can make it work for everybody. I talked to a magazine editor. Um, who, uh, he's a friend of mine. He works for a magazine. I won't say the name of the magazine, but he read my book a while back uh, while I was working on it. And he said, you know, our magazine really is like the in-flight magazine for surveillance capitalism. <laughs> Once he understood where surveil what surveillance capitalism is. And MIT, at least parts of MIT, not every, because I lovingly quote Joe Wiesenbaum. You remember Joe Wiesenbaum? Oh. Well, is Joe that Wiesenbaum, the little red schoolhouse of surveillance no, capitalism? No, Joe Wiesenbaum was um, a wonderful um, scholar at MIT uh, who wrote about uh, human-centered computing. And he was very concerned uh, yeah, okay, about yeah. uh, artificial intelligence and what was being done at, at, at MIT where inventors were disassociated from what they were inventing and its consequences. And that's really where Joe came in. He was, he was a, a brilliant, you remember that whole thing about the LISA program where uh, it fed back to you what you said and people didn't know it was a computer? This goes way back to the 1970s, guys. But, um, and, and people actually thought that, that they were being, you know, in, interviewed by a therapist because it was just doing re reflective listening. Anyway, that was Joe Wiesenbaum invented that. Um, so I, I write about him and I, you know, sort of, Joe, where are you when we need you? Hmm. Because not all of MIT, but a, a, there are parts of MIT which really are like the um, advanced R&D lab for surveillance capitalism. Hmm. And I write about many colleagues at MIT who are producing both the theory and the practice and the devices uh, that are you know, immediately sucked up into this new surveillance-based economic order. Including the media lab, maybe, or not? Indeed. Hmm. Indeed. Uh, many characters from the media lab uh, uh, figure in this book, I will say. Men, much work that's going on there. Not yes. Chomsky. Not Chomsky. Shoshana and Chris, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm, I know people would like this conversation to go on and on. Um, Shoshana, I want to thank you so very much for uh, coming to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. We are honored to have you here. Um, Chris, thank you for your um, magnificent moderation. You're going to do this again tomorrow on the radio. At well, I'm, I was about to say that. So uh, Shoshana will be visiting Chris Lydon's uh, radio show tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. Um, it's w